very honored to welcome our uh, keynote speaker for the session, uh, Professor Anastasios uh, Marianis. I'm, please excuse me, sir, if I'm mispronouncing your name and uh, correct me if needed. We are pleased to have you here today with us. Professor Anastasios Marianis, PhD, PFHEA, FRSA, serves as the Associate Head of the Design Creative and Digital Industries College and Research Professor of Inclusive Design. His role involves academic leadership and strategic direction, collaborating with the DVC for global engagement to enhance international employability, corporate social responsibility, and external public engagement strategies across colleges. He previously served as the Dean of the School of Design and TNE Director at the University of Greenwich, focusing on curriculum development in inclusivity and sustainability. His expertise extends to forging innovative partnership globally, emphasizing staff empowerment, student employability, and entrepreneurial skills in architecture, design, media, business, and visual arts. Professor Marianis was a governor of Greenwich University's Board of Trustees and contributed significantly to the institution's partnership hub and professional practice framework. He played a pivotal role in the TEF 2021 submission, particularly in transitional education within creative and digital industries. As an interdisciplinary researcher and advocate for pedagogic practice, Professor Marianis has led various academic roles spanning product design engineering, sustainable and uh, digital cities, design anthropology, interdisciplinary design methods, animation, film production, and media. Notably, he facilitated the international research project Design and Space for Life on Earth by WDO and International Space Station. He also served as the principal investigator for NWE, and uh, had a 4.2 million euro funded project supporting youth entrepreneurship and innovation. His practice research outputs have been exhibited globally, including prestigious venues like V&A Museum London and London Design Festival. Thank you so much for being here with us today, sir. Over to you. We are very excited to uh, see your presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh... Is that Sarma, right? So uh, I'm going to share my screen quickly. Sure. Just, just give me one second. It's allow me, if you give me one second, I'll be with you. I think it's trying to, no, to restart sure. this. Yeah.
can, can you see my screen? Yes, sir. We can. Yes, sir. Let me see if I can put on presenters mode. Yes, it's perfect, sir. Okay, great. I need to let me give me one second. For some reason, it's very slow. The so do you see the whole screen? I don't know what you see exactly now. We so we are seeing we are seeing presenter view here. Yeah. Okay, so. I think this is better, right? Yes, sir. we can see the full screen. Great. So thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, uh, it's great to, to be here online. Uh, I'm currently traveling, so I'm quite, you know, in different time zones. So I'm, I'm sending you greetings from Athens, Greece. Uh, so usually I'm based in London. Uh, it was a very good introduction. Thank you so much. Um, Yes, as 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 you said, uh, I'm a professor uh, in inclusive design in uh, in the College of Design, Creative and Digital Industries uh, in the University of Westminster uh, in London, and uh, part of my role is to, as associate head of the college, to look after external relations for areas around. Um, uh, design creative industries but architecture and urban design and planning so one of the biggest programs that we are offering uh, at the University of Westminster is architecture uh, urban design and air transport planning and my role as a, prof a research professor is to look uh, in more detail how we can um, work together uh, in and perhaps and embrace neurodiversity uh, youth uh, around those areas. So part of my work previously, uh, it was around young people, people that they engage in the society and how creative co-design and participatory design methods allowed to uh, engage those young people in the society. So what we're going to do today, I'm going to uh, talk to you a bit about a vision of 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 for inclusive and, and urban design. So, uh, how do we create in, uh, methods? How are we creating processes? How are we celebrating um, neurodiversity within youth? Uh, and I will try to delve into innovative design principles, technological advancements, and participatory strategies that foster inclusion and empowerment. So through our methods and especially through architecture, urban design and planning. So in an area, in an era of where urbanization and technological advance, advancement um, shape our living environments, it is imperative to foster uh, inclusive urban design that cater to the diverse needs to all citizens. This can note Today, it needs to fo focusing on the integration of neurodiverse youth within the fabric of, of urban spaces, ensuring that cities not only accommodate, but also celebrate and empowering this often overlooked demographic. By exploring sustainable urban development, smart cities, innovations, data-informed uh, design, strategies will also unveil how inclusive design can transform urban landscapes into heavens of opportunity, creativity, and accessibility for neurodiverse youth. So neurodiversity acknowledges the natural variation of the human brain and cognition, conditions such as autism, uh, spectrum disorder, ADHD and dyslexia represent different ways of thinking and interacting with the world. Recognizing um, neurodiversity in urban planning and architecture is crucial because it ensures that, that the built environment supports and empowers individuals with diverse neurological conditions, pro promoting equity and inclusion. So, 
neurodivergent conditions, just to start with what they are and how we can take into account this presentation, uh, includes autism spectrum disorder, attention deficit, hyperactive disorder, etc., etc. It has been reported that up to 17% of the population have been diagnosed with a neurodivergent condition. 4% of the population have ADHD, 1% have autism, 10% have dyslexia, 1% have dyspraxia, which means that it's like not understanding the space that they are, and we'll come to that about that later when I'm going to tell you about the spaces. 1% um, have Tourette syndrome. When you consider that many conditions go undiagnosed, 17% is therefore likely to be conservative at best. So uh, the World Health Organization noted that the prevalence of neurological conditions uh, is one of the greatest threats to the public health. And when it comes to the architecture and the urban building environment, sometimes we forget those conditions and the 17% of the world with the people we're working with or the people we're designing for or, or creating spaces for. So we are living in a time uh, of increased neurodiversity and awareness about ADHD, dyslexia, autism, etc. In fact, one in eight people are considered neurodivergent, uh, but fewer than 50% know about it. Neurodivergence tends to be high energy, out of the box thinkers, excel in navigation and modern workplace can be a challenge. Not only in designing space or urban environment, to be inclusive, the right thing to do, there is a compelling business case for it as well. Space today needs to reflect diverse makeup organizations to set up all of success. The main problems that obstacles that the youth facing, uh, neurodiverse youth often uh, face significant challenges in their urban environment. Sensory overloaded from bright lights, noises, people, construction, confusing navigation, materials, uh, cultural developments, and lack of perhaps quiet spaces. And I'm sure that this is one of the aspects in India with the population, with this rapidly changing growth, big cities. Um, so can make cities, all this above I mentioned, can make cities uh, a bit not comfortable for youth, uh, neurodiverse youth, and make them overwhelming. According to, to recent studies, uh, only a small percentage of urban spaces are designed with neurodiverse individuals in mind, highlighting the urgent needs for more inclusive design practices. And again, this is a very uh, financial economic phenomenon that you can only see uh, as improvement to big cities or uh, civil or or societies where uh, qu are quite wealthy. You can get an example here that the the, the urbanization is rapidly uh, changing our cities. Um, the concept of smart cities have emerged from issues um, are arise as in on the photo here busy urban spaces as bacon for creative, more efficient, connected, and safer urban environments. Among the innovative technologies contributing to the vision, smart city kiosks play a pivotal role in enhancing public safety here. So how do we create uh, benefit? How are we making spaces and how are we building societies and, and, and cities that can benefit all citizens? through flexi and having flexibility, simplicity, intuitive use. So inclusive design is where it comes in in our practices. It's grounded in principles that prioritize flexibility, um, simplicity, and, and, and intuitive use. Architectural spaces should adapt for a variety of needs, ensuring that they are easy to navigate and understand. These principles 
not only benefit neurodiverse individuals, but also enhance the overall usability of urban environments for everyone fostering a more inclusive and equitable society. On exemplary projects, for example, there are a couple of projects, and I'm going to show you a number of them here, that integrates inclusive design in its architecture and planning in order to uh, address those kind of issues and engage like the urban uh, built environment in relation to uh, the people using the spaces. So one exemplary project uh, is the Magic Center designed to provide supportive environment for individuals with cancer. These centers incorporate elements of inclusive design by offering sensory friendly spaces, uh, but also uh, those projects il uh, illustrate how thoughtful architecture design can create welcoming, accessible uh, environments for, for all users. Um, I'm going to take you a bit back to, to understand a bit what it takes to redesign uh, spaces and how those spaces can be used in order to uh, rethink who is using them and how. To the gates ago, uh, more or less, uh, Dubai transformed from a desert city to a one-of-a-kind metropolis, counting the tallest building in the world as part of its skyline. The, the Burj Khalifa is the construction of superlative designed by Skidmore, Owing and Merrill LLP, from Chicago, and with the consultation of Adrian Smith in 2004. Uh, six years later, the time in 2010, uh, the city celebrated its opening and the 1.5 billion project came to an end. 30 million apartments, 30,000 apartments, sorry, nine hotels, a mall, and a lake can be found in the construction that broke all records. What does it mean for the urban design and neurodiverse citizens? We have an opportunity to design cities based on the people that they are using these, these cities. We have an opportunity to restructure the built environment in a way that it reflects to the current society and all the society we're trying to accommodate and bring in uh, within our space. Another example is a Beckett urban square uh, before and, and after the public space. For years, the RMIT University in Melbourne, Australia, used the 2,800 square meter space as a car park surrounded by its academic buildings. In 2012, the city mayor took a stand against inactive property owners and sparked the wave of urban interventions, including the uh, that Beckett Urban Square of RMIT. The former car park was turned into a pop-up park in 2013 and completed a year later for all the students to use. Uh, Peter Elliott Architecture and Urban Design took over the 1.2 billion USD project and designed a space designated for active and cultural engagement, engaging people and young, young youth uh, through active and casual engagement, incorporating sports, courts, landscape, barbecue facilities, and bike parking. This urban space is only a temporary use of, for the space until uh, the University of MIT continues with its own expansion. So this is another example of how we can engage the society by making the spaces, by building spaces on existing sites or developing new. Neurodiverse theme neighborhoods of a strategy to enhance the livability of cities. Uh, this is the blueprint of an autism village uh, in benefits to neurotype, type, neurotypical environments by uh, Everydice Rohana Lochan. Um, Lochan developed an article with some practice work demonstrating how we're developing uh, a neurodiverse uh, space environment 
for that she called Autism Village, a village that will be designed from scratch, considering architecture design, the build space, environment space, and construction in order to address issues of autism in our society. The article uh, by Lotsans that she proposed, uh, she pro she's proposing that designing urban spaces to cater to the needs of individuals with autism spectrum disorder, ASD in other words, not only addresses their unique challenges and well-being of both neurodivergent and neurotypical populations, but is an advocate for inclusive design as a strategy to improve urban environments. The enhancement in the proposed residential setting supports uh, the well-being of those individuals. More than just a place to live, the overall um, concept of the autism village brings an opportunity for the autism uh, individual to exhibit their strengths, to challenge their capabilities, and be part of a society. There might be, however, a serious concern on the safety of the residents since the protocol is to open the community to the public on a certain days, but to achieve a broader goal of, uh, of a social inclusion is not exclusively uh, contingent upon the individual. There is also a need for neurotypicals to accept and appreciate them. So, when we are creating these kind of places and smart cities like the autism village, we have to consider how technology is changing, how technology making our process of building environment architecture easier, challenging, and also reflects the sustainable development goals and sustainable development goals of the United Nations. Smart cities leverage technology to enhance the quality um, of urban life. Innovations such as sensory-friendly public spaces, real-time navigation app, tailor for neurodiverse users and citizens, and interact installations that adjust stimuli levels can transform those urban environments. These technologies can all not only make cities um, more accessible, but also ensure that architectural designs are responsive to the needs of uh, neurodiverse individuals. Sustainable urban uh, development seeks to balance environmental, social, economic goals. Inclusive design aligns with these goals by promoting social equality um, and reducing barriers. For example, the, the Bosco vertical in Milan uh, integrates the green architecture with accessible design, providing a sustainable and a sustainable and inclusive environment. That is the building. Uh, I don't know something happened in my slides. That was the vertical building in Milan, a new development where it features uh, um, green sustainable development goals, spaces uh, in, as part of architecture. And that approach ensures that urban spaces are environmental friendly and social inclusive. Let's go back to this kind of idea of the smart cities uh, that will soon change the urban center. As the, inter as the Internet of Things continues to permit more areas of modern life, we have begun to see the rise of the smart city. These urban areas leverage uh, in information technology like sensors and big beacons to collect data and better manage a city's resource, service, and operation. This ultimately makes a city safer and can improve the quality of life for residents. Because these smart cities technology is virtual, invisibly, invisible to those who aren't operating it, like everyday users, many outside of the technology industry may not realize that the full impact of Internet of Things can have an urban life. So there are a number of experts, as described by Forbes Technology Council, that they explain some of the current and upcoming tech innovation that are changing the way cities function. So security, 
traffic monitoring, uh, 5G, where it's giving us the ability to connect millions of devices combined with high-speed connections, uh, augmented reality, uh, and uh, air quality monitoring. This is what the smart cities are doing now to make sure that populations from construction, combustion products, and violatile organic compounds pose a serious health risk, so we reduce that. Uh, we have the smart cities also help us to work through contactless technology, where on uh, contactless technology, whether payment, meter, readings, or preventing health will be essential, both in terms of saving time and cost, as well as enhancing health and safety. Then we have mobility alerts to inform through different ways of how a building might be at an earthquake or a big catastrophe or weather condition is coming. Smart cities use technology to achieve the goals of a better quality of life and sustainable living to the citizens. One of the main areas actually uh, of improvement or system of this mobility includes po pollution alerts to help asthma patients, maintenance alerts, for bad road conditions, enabling self-driving cars and alerts about traffic congestions. So those are the things that are actually informing your diverse citizens and, and rechanging the shape of the city as it didn't happen before. In addition, we have urban farming. So where smart cities go, for example, with the urban farming hand in hand, I would say, with the increased number of people living in cities, we started needing to come up with a sustainable solution to improve the food quality and energy usage and reduce transportation costs. Um, Singapore, for example, was uh, an early adopter of this vertical agriculture and it has uh, made the city more self-sufficient while having a positive environmental impact. So all of those things inform how we are uh, building our societies, how we are considering the environment and architecture planning. So the smart transportation, for example, use technology which enhance the cities. So smart, tra smart traffic lights will streamline the follow of vehicles to optimize traffic energy and uh, and any any with vehicle outcome taking over connected cars that can communicate with each other will lead to fewer solutions and ultimately safer city roads for those that perhaps are disabled or for those that also uh, are using support to exist in the city. All this information from the uh, smart cities and the changes uh, informing our data and is playing a crucial role in informing how inclusive design can be uh, an advocate for urban spaces. By analyzing data on how neurodiverse individuals um, interact with urban spaces, Architects, build environments, construction managers can create environments that better meet their needs. Tools like geographic information systems, GIS, and user experience surveys provide valuable insights enabling data-driven decisions that enhance accessibility and inclusivity um, in architectural design. However, it is always important to reconsider who is taking part in this overall thinking of the urban spaces uh, process. Par participatory design involves neurodiverse people through co-design methods. Involving neurodiverse youth in the design process ensures that their perspectives and needs, um, their perspective and needs are considered. Participatory design methods, such as uh, co-design workshops, focus groups, allow those individuals to contribute their unique insights collaboratively uh, uh, with everyone else. So both physical and digital, and digital, we can facilitate ongoing dialogue and engagement, leading to more inclusive and effective architectural solutions. Cities 
are, are not designed for neurodiverse population. Let's face that. Restoring ground and all ages playground in Mahanta aims to change exactly this. This is the project uh, that uh, it was specifically focused on, on, on um, how cities can be more, uh, how cities can be redesigned. So we live in a time of increased awareness about neurodiversity, and that's great, absolutely fantastic, and it was about time that to happen. One in four, 54 young children has been diagnosed with autism, and the World Health Organization, as I mentioned earlier, estimates that one in eight in the world uh, is neurodiverse. Uh, many of those conditions considered hard to diagnose, the number is likely higher, yet cities are still failing to reflect that diverse. In Hudson Square, uh, a tiny pocket of Manhattan, once known as the Printing District, and nestled between Soho, Tribeca, and the West of Village there in New York, uh, a new public space seeks to tip the scales in a more inclusive direction. I showed you earlier a number of images and projects from around the world, from Dubai to uh, some cities in uh, in, in different parts of the world and say how we design something from scratch. But what's happening when we have existing spaces, like in big cities where they've been developed uh, organically, like for example, in Mumbai, uh, in Delhi, in London or, or, or other places or Athens around the world. Uh, and then how we can design spaces uh, to, to, to address new public spaces that can scale uh, in a more inclusive direction. This is a project designed by WIP Collaborative, a feminist collective made up of independent design professionals, the temporary public art installation, DAB Restoring Ground, that's the name of it, providing a supportive gathering space for people of all ages, backgrounds, and spectrums of neurodiversity. In early 2020, it's like almost four years ago, the WIP collaboratively conducted interviews with a dozen of experts and advocates on neurodiversity, including people with children, with autism, and organizations like the Global Autism Project, which is a non-profit organization, uh, and working up to scale this project uh, and see how particular research can increase uh, engagement to the society. Public spaces uh, should be redesigned. Will uh, uh, should be designed with features that support neurodiverse individuals. Sensory gardens will provide, for example, a variety of sensory experience uh, in controlled environments and quiet zones, which offer refuge for urban noise and essential uh, interactive installation that allowed the engagement in different places. And as I said earlier in this project, uh, in New York City and elsewhere, people without children uh, are specifically prohibited from playgrounds for the obvious reasons. Uh, and why they said, tell us that interaction between older people um, and, younger, and young children have positive effects for both groups. Opportunity for such interactions in the public realm are thin, are very slim, doesn't exist. The way we are approaching the project, uh, then the creators of the project here said that, um, is that we can learn from population with challenges and be inspired by them. Harkema says, and, and when you provide them in this range, it becomes more flexible for the broader population. So I'm going to take you to the other side of the world. So we started from uh, Dubai. We went to, uh, to Italy, to New York, and then now we're going to go to a bit in, in China. Uh, it is no, now commonplace uh, in, uh, for master plans and the urban and built environment to follow the 15-minute city principles. Uh, designing an urban district so that all of the uses and amenities a person needs can be used and found within 15 minutes walk from there where they live is essential with those functions placed intelligently so that the shortage generate are far more regular trips. So this is the new 15-month city principles that we're using for the urban environment. And that helps 
people, not only neurodiverse, but all citizens. The 50, 15 minute uh, living, living inherently involves compact mixed use neighborhoods with all the necessary details from office, leisure, um, uh, hospitality, civic, religious, and service building close together. However, the spirit of the 15 minutes, and you have an example here of the Xiong'an new area, um, requires us to think about more than just convenience and minimizing the journey between the home and the required amenity. Particularly in the short journeys, uh, means very little time spent outdoors. People also need public space, somewhere to stretch their legs, exercise, socialize, experience future, nature, feel the sunshine, and here nothing's quite strong, I have to say, uh, and physical well-being. The path between indoor starting and indoor finishing point needs to be enjoyable and people friendly, not just functioning efficient so that there is uh, a value in the walk itself. So there are quite a few areas to consider when you are even designing with those kind of principles. However, all these kind of things, again, principles, developing policy making, it comes from the education and the awareness. Educating urban planners and architects and build environment and construction management and spaces and transport builders and transport designers and, and, and landscape architects and landscape developers. It is an essential part of the world we're living in in the world that we want to change. Educating these people and raising awareness about neurodiversity and about these 17% of the people that we know of and the 50% of the people that they don't know of and the one out of eight people that they have a condition that we are not aware of is vital for fostering inclusive design and extremely important to understand the people that they live in our society. Training programs workshops, universities can raise this awareness and provide practical strategies for integrating inclusive design principles. Initiates such as the Neurodiversity in Design or the Urban Design Inclusive Design Guide published by the Design Council in the UK a couple of years ago or how inclusive design affects the built environment. Uh, offer resources and support to professional committed to creating more accessible and equitable built environments. Uh, we can embrace neurodiversity in design and education. We can develop curriculum with interdisciplinary approach. We can collaborate with departments of psychology, occupational therapy, and special education to develop a comprehensive curriculum that architects and building environment and designers are aware of those conditions. We can offer modules, uh, courses that can be integrated into existing architecture and urban planning programs, or even taking a standalone professional development opportunities for those in the built environment where they have no understanding or limited understanding about those citizens. One of the most important thing when it comes to education about neurodiverse citizens is the faculty training. We need to conduct training and workshops that can train faculty members, uh, academics on concepts of neurodiversity and inclusive uh, uh, sessions. We can establish mentorship programs. We can create community partnerships, industry collaborations. We can raise, raise public awareness and campaign. I'm very pleased to say that in some of the areas here, there are quite a few policies developed around the area of, uh, of neurodiversity. So if we engage the broader community through public lecture exhibitions, media, et cetera, you can see that we can address things around housing, district heating, emergency efficiency, solid waste, urban roads, public transport, et cetera. And there are policies, the graph you see here on the screen, there are policy, policies that exist and they showcase that how, uh, how we can do that. COVID was a very good example that we shifted from one area to another, giving more opportunities and more of... Uh, 
uh, access access to uh, to people. So urban infrastructure and services are not gender neutral. Gender inclusive cities and needs to be uh, informed. Women are affected disproportionately by caps in access to sustainable infrastructure. We know that. I can give an example that we're designing train stations with toilets and we are not considering female uh, 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 women in the design process where we know that in a busy uh, a train station, a bigger toilet might be required for, for the women rather than for the men for, for, for different needs. So there's a lot of things that policy have included and brought in, especially around our gender as well, or not only you know, diverse citizens that we need to adopt. So talking about this policy, the legislation and community engagement, policies and legislation playing an important and critical role in promoting inclusive design. In European Union, this uh, is a bit more standard compared with uh, other parts of the world, but I see that there is a, a movement of following those policies. Current policies such as the Americans, for example, uh, with Disabilities Act, um, and date accessibility standards in public spaces, which is great. Advocacy for neurodiverse friendly policies ensures that the standards are continually uh, updated and enforced, encouraging the development of urban environments that accommodate the diverse needs of all citizens. So inclusive design fosters a stronger, uh, fosters a stronger, more connected communities by ensuring that all members feel welcomed and valued. Architectural and urban design features uh, that facilitate social interaction and accessibility contribute to the sense of community. Events such as inclusive design charities and community workshops not only raise awareness, but also empower residents to actively participate in their urban environment. And this is where the building environment plays an important role. Closing, uh, I would like to say that designing inclusive futures involve recognizing and celebrating neurodiversity, addressing and celebrating uh, change. Uh, it can address current challenges, uh, implement principles of inclusive design architecture and urban planning. By leveraging technology data and community engagement, we can create urban spaces that empower neurodiversity and especially youth. I urge you all being here today to incorporate these principles in your work, advocating for and, and advocating for and designing truly inclusive environments. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for such an insightful presentation. And uh, I'm sure we've all had uh, good learnings from it that we'll, uh, that will enrich all the discussions further on in the conference. Thank you so much, sir.